worldwide cases of the coronavirus have surpassed 100,000. Researchers across the world are working to create a vaccine to tackle the novel coronavirus. Across the globe, more cases are surging. Hello and welcome to The Nexus. This is our third show on the coronavirus, and today we're focusing on the race for a vaccine. Right now, there are dozens of laboratories around the world working on it, and the question on everyone's lips, how long will it take? We're going to be asking Dr. Paul Mackay, who's leading an effort to find the vaccine here in London. We'll also be considering the risks to people taking part in vaccine trials. $4,500 to be injected with coronavirus, tempted, and President Trump slammed for asking drug company bosses this question. But the same vaccine could not work. You take a, a solid flu vaccine, you don't think that would have an impact or much of an impact on corona? We'll try to answer all of those questions with our panel in a moment. But first, a quick look at the global race for a vaccine. The vaccines stimulate production by the body of billions of protective antibodies which build a wall. But behind it all are tests and research and years of development and hope. Simple. Is it? Is it? Is it? A British scientist has apparently made a breakthrough in the race for a vaccine. A team of Australians is trying to develop a vaccine. South Korean researchers have discovered antibodies. Researchers across the world are working to create a vaccine to tackle the novel coronavirus. In the race to contain the coronavirus, a win for the first to cross the finish line with a vaccine or a treatment is a win for all. Work is underway on a vaccine in a number of labs around the world. It really is a race against time, isn't it? Absolutely. Pharmaceuticals giant Sanofi today confirmed it's jumped into the race. The company joins Johnson & Johnson and biotech company Moderna. American businesses are stepping up. The race for a coronavirus vaccine, which companies are leading the pack? Yeah, we are comfortable that we can create a vaccine and scale it up. We're trying to do this in, for us, what will be record-setting time. We're going at record right. speed, getting into clinical trials, but that's not something that's going to impact people that are sick now or this first wave of the outbreak. Since vaccines are given to normal individuals, what is paramount is safety and whether or not it works. There are a lot of people that will get sick and a lot of people that will unfortunately die before vaccines become available. The good news is we did it fast. The bad news is that the reality of vaccinology means this is not going to be something that happens tomorrow. Well, let's get straight to our guests now. And we're going to be starting with Paul Mackay, a scientist working on finding a vaccine at Imperial College London. He's really at the leading edge of this global effort. Uh, Dr. Mackay, thank you so much for joining us here on The Nexus. There are a number of crucial steps in finding a vaccine. I want to just take our viewers through it really quickly. The exploratory stage, which includes gene sequencing of the virus, which the Chinese completed and shared with the world back in January. Uh, scientists like yourself then take a part of that gene sequence, which is then injected into animals to see if the required antibodies are made. And then it's on to the three stages of testing in humans, numbering less than 100, then hundreds, and then thousands. And finally, regulatory approval. Now, you're at the animal testing stage right now, the first laboratory outside of China uh, to reach that stage. What results have you had so far? So the results have been very good. We have got um, reasonable responses in uh, mice, and we are also doing um, various different experiments in mice and we're also testing it on uh, in monkeys. And uh, that testing in monkeys also started this week. So we will have a good set of uh, preclinical data uh, very soon. Some people will be a bit concerned that you have to test on animals, but that is an absolute necessity at this point? It is an absolute necessity. You cannot replicate the immune system in vitro. Uh, our, our, we make great efforts to reduce the number of animals that we use but you can't completely replace animals at this time. And when are you likely to move on to testing in humans? Well, we're hoping to move on to test our candidate vaccine in humans by about June. I understand there's a other laboratory uh, called Moderna, uh, which expects to be testing sometime at the end of this month, March, or early April. Um, Absolutely. Wh why, why are they slightly ahead? What's the difference here? Uh, so they are a, a large uh, company. Um, they have a lot of people working on the um, uh, development of the vaccine. Uh, we are a small laboratory in London, 
and uh, we have done it almost as quickly as they have, but perhaps not a quick, as quickly. And, and people talk about, indeed we are talking about, the race for a vaccine. Is it competitive among scientists or collaborative? Um, it's more collaborative than competitive. I mean, each individual, of course, has uh, their own um, competitive nature and their uh, want and desire to make a vaccine. But um, scientists are by nature extremely collaborative. We uh, collaborate with a large number of different labs and um, uh, collaborations in our, in our DNA, so to speak. And when do you expect to have a vaccine available for the general population? Well, I mean, as you said in your introduction, it takes uh, quite a number of steps for to make sure that a vaccine is, first of all, safe, and secondly, that it uh, has um, efficacy, that it's able to uh, generate the immune responses that you would want it to have. And those testings are absolutely necessary, and they will take um, approximately one year. And that, it, to put it into context, is incredibly fast. What is the typical time it takes to find a vaccine over the past few decades? Oh, typically, to get to the stage of even testing it in humans is, has been about three years. And, uh, but in general, the amount of time it takes to, to bring a vaccine to regulatory approval is in the, in the realms of six to 10 years. And six years is ambitious and 10 years is more typical. Now, obviously, the scientists, including yourself, are going at record-breaking speed, but it does mean that between now and for the next, say, 12 months or so, there's no vaccine. What does that mean for the population? They have to rely on treatments? Yes, so, I mean, the, one of the interesting things about this particular virus is that there's a number of treatments which uh, um, are indicated for other diseases which have already been shown to have an effect on the replication of the virus within a person. So if you can give them an anti -retro, uh, antiviral drug, then sometimes that can reduce the severity of their disease and, uh, or, or uh, cause the virus to replicate slowly so that the body has got time to deal with it. And there's a number of different companies which are trying out the drugs that are already licensed for use in people to see if they have this effect. So there, there could be treatments that are available to the population while we're waiting for a vaccine to be developed. Dr. Mackay, thank you for taking the time out of your very busy day to explain what you are doing in the laboratory, and we wish you all the best uh, in finding a vaccine, of course. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, of course, testing a vaccine on humans requires volunteers, and this week, one of the UK's most popular newspapers reported how a London laboratory was offering around $4,500 to take part in a coronavirus vaccine trial. But we went out on the streets of London to see if people were willing to take part. I mean, if it helps to develop a vaccine, why not? I personally wouldn't because I can't compromise my health right now. But if I was in need of money, I do think that, yeah. I would if I didn't have any family or people who I would then infect. No. <laughs> no, thank you. I wouldn't mind. To be with you. He wouldn't mind. I wouldn't mind, um, yeah. If he's going to benefit other people, yeah, I would love it, yeah. I have had asthma in the past, so I wouldn't, I just wouldn't be willing to, you know, I, I, suddenly it's like, whoa, no. Well, let's bring in our last two guests now, and Professor Ken Stedman is a virologist who spent decades researching viruses, and Steve Brozak is one of America's leading healthcare investment analysts who knows all about the financial challenges that companies face in bringing vaccines to the market. Um, Professor Stedman, let me start with you. Um, We've got testing on humans expected later this month in some cases or in April, uh, May or June for some other uh, companies. What are the risks to the people taking part? So the risks to someone taking part in these are actually minimal and a lot of the process which is used in terms of determining clinical trials in the first place is to reduce the risk as much as possible. So in these very first, the first round of clinical trials, these are really safety trials. And so what happens is you start with a very small amount of the vaccine, and then you slowly increase it. And in the process, you're always monitoring the people who are getting that particular vaccine. That's partly why this process takes so long. You start at very, very low amounts and slowly bring them up. And in your experience, is it difficult to persuade people to take part? 
so I've never personally participated in these clinical trials, either from the person injecting point of view or actually taking them myself. Um, but my understanding is it's actually usually relatively straightforward to start the trials, particularly at this phase one. But every clinical trial is a little bit different right. because it depends on what patients you're talking about. It depends on exactly what you're trying to use it for. If you have a particular product, which is going to be, again, vaccines for kids, you have to try and find kids you're going yeah. to be testing it on. If it's going to be for older people, you need to find older people. So the, the whole process of actually setting up a clinical trial takes a very long time. And the process of what's called recruitment, you know, going out in the street, as you already did, yeah. talking to people and Steve, finding the right people. And Steve, in your experience, is it difficult to find people to fill these trials? On the earlier sa safety trials? No, it's not usually a problem. The problem is more along the lines of the, the collection of the information than understanding what you're looking at. Um, and here's, a, here's an unusual situation. You're talking about a potential vaccine that, for all intents and purposes, will be developed in record time and then possibly administered to the largest population at one given time. So it, it, there's a lot of Herculean tasks that are literally uh, around the supply systems and how do you do it. Yeah. Also. If you have a vaccine that you're making, there's no guarantees that you're going to be able to make enough di given the different um, uh, modes of, of manufacturing that we have today. That's a, that's a really good point. And I, I would like to ask you about that, actually. Um, once you've got regulatory approval, how do you go about scaling up and making sure there's enough for everyone? Well, you mentioned uh, you know, Moderna in the past. It's an RNA-made uh, vaccine, which gives it some inherent advantages, but at the same time, there are also questions. Do you need just one inject injection? Do you need a booster? How would you administer that? What, uh, what are the lot sizes that you can make? Um, and, and I want to be clear about this. If you were to take all of the medical advancements we've made in the history, going back to Hippocrates, vaccines outstrip all of them in terms of saving you, human life combined. So it isn't that the vaccines are not incredibly important. But it's unrealistic to expect them to be that proverbial silver bullet today. And yeah. we should be talking about other approaches as well. And we will. Uh, let me ask you about who gets the vaccines once, once it is passed by the, the regulators. Who decides who is getting the vaccines first? Typically, you would start to see uh, healthcare providers, those people that are on the front lines that need um, in, as close as you can get immunization because they're going to be overly exposed to patients and people that are suspected of having uh, the virus. It's the same way you would see it in, uh, in Ebola or in any other highly uh, transmissible pathogen. Oh, we mentioned the, uh, the regulators have to be satisfied, of course. Um, that is a, a big task. I know that they, they participate all along the way, um, but how hard is it to get them to approve it? One of the things you have to understand in terms of the regulatory process is that um, the focus has to be on safety because there is literally nothing worse than having no virus, a, a no vaccine other than having a vaccine that has issues in its safety profile, especially when you consider the potential population that's going to be using this. Well, that would cause enormous damage if, if a faulty vaccine came out, obviously. Well, just understand this, that a vaccine doesn't necessarily have to be faulty to have side effects. There's a predisposition in a certain part of the population that is, is you know, obviously going to have some outcomes that are going to be, you know, not good. Uh, but the overall thought behind it is twofold. Number one, you want to make sure that you um, get people uh, that have some kind of immunity towards it. And also that herd immunity concept where um, it'll be harder for the virus to transmit with people that are immunized as well. Okay. Now, with two previous coronaviruses, SARS and MERS, the outbreak actually ended before a vaccine could be found. The SARS outbreak lasted around 18 months and the MERS outbreak lasted approximately 33 months. Both killed less than 1,000 people. COVID-19 has killed far more than both combined since it was discovered barely three months ago in Wuhan in China. Steve, uh, is it possible that this coronavirus outbreak could end before a vaccine is found? It's possible, but at this point, given the vast spread, it's probably very unlikely. Yeah. For all intents and purposes, it is a pandemic. 
and it will more than likely become part of the lexicon for epidemiologists, for, for people overall, to uh, say this is the coronavirus into the future. Right. So it'll become synonymous with that. Um, uh, Professor Stedman, I, I ask primarily because I've read some reports that say the warmer temperatures uh, as we move in parts of the globe to spring might just kill it off. Some people have said that. Uh, unfortunately, we have zero evidence for this particular virus, whether that's going to be the case. Um, SARS definitely went down, but whether that was seasonal or having to do with controls, we don't know. And MERS, um, I hate to contradict you, but there still are MERS cases happening right now, just they don't spread very far. Right. Um, and and does, one but thing, just because there are a few cases, does that mean the outbreak isn't over, or is an outbreak defined as a much, much greater number of people being affected? Really depends on your definition of what an outbreak is. Right. I would say the cases for MERS are just little mini outbreaks that are happening at any particular time. But getting back to your question about the seasonality, we really don't understand seasonality for any virus, let alone for this new coronavirus. Steve, given that it costs hundreds of millions of dollars to produce a vaccine, apparently on average nearly half a billion dollars, um, are there companies reluctant to step in given and look for a vaccine, given that the whole thing could all be over by the time they get one ready? Well, let's just up the number here. Uh, we're talking probably about a billion dollars, uh, you know, given the development, testing, manufacturing process. So, um, and then this one is going to cost far more than that, given everything. So you raise a very fair point. But one of the things that should also be addressed, the, the Merck's, the Pfizer's, the Sanofi's, the GSK's, and, and even Johnson & Johnson in this case, they're not just doing this for money. It might sound uh, uh, a little bit hard to believe, but these are people that are focused on going out there and improving health care. And they understand that this is critically important at this step for not just them, but the entirety of the globe. And when you start to look at it that way, they obviously could, you know, the franchises could make much more in orphan drugs and things like that. But yeah. this is the reason they do this. And they believe it's part of their mission to, to have their companies go forward with this. And the last part is, if they don't do it, who will? Well, that's fair enough. But I have seen on a number of financial channels, of course, they do focus uh, on the share prices of some of these companies, which we have seen seesawing. Some of them have been actually going up quite a lot. There is one sector that's been immune to the recent market weakness. What is it? It's biotech. Uh, there is, like you said, a peaked interest in some of these biotech stocks. Uh, may I suggest you try Regeneron? It's another great vaccine company. They were the ones that beat Ebola. The company that finds the vaccine first, it, is, does it stand to make a fortune? Um, well, let's look at it with the Ebola vaccine. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's a product that, you know, uh, you won't pay anything for until you need it. And then when you need it, you'll pay anything that you have to get it. So that's, that's one of the jokes in, in the vaccine industry. But with this particular vaccine, it's going to be not just one vaccine, probably multiple vaccines. And in, in this case, it also highlights the fact that each of the states, and I'm talking about sovereign states, will have to um, aggressively work with these companies to make sure that there is some incentivization for them to make it, not just today, but into the future. And also, when this virus does change, and that's what these viruses do, to make the next generation of vaccines, it'll probably also be required. Uh, a question for both of you, really. Uh, while we're waiting for a vaccine, which could be 12 to, say, 18 months away, uh, people are getting sick, some are dying. Uh, people want to know if there are treatments, either in the pipeline or already available, which could help mitigate the symptoms of COVID-19. Uh, Professor Stedman? So there are really two things. There's a mitigation of symptoms, and there's also treating the particular virus. And there are treatments for the virus right now. They're going through exactly the same kind of clinical trials that we've been talking about already for the vaccines, testing at small levels and going up. And so there are a couple of currently approved drugs that people are looking at and also new drugs that people are trying to find. So hopefully in a shorter period of time than it will take for a vaccine, there should be some drugs online that'll be able to be used. Uh, can I mention one to you in particular, Steve? There's a Remdesivir made by Gilead, a huge American biotech company. Can you tell us about that and what it does? Sure, sure. That's a, uh, that's a, 
uh, an antiviral that was created uh, specific to the Ebola uh, crisis. Um, it sh basically it shuts down the um, the virus's ability to replicate, so it makes it less efficient, and in theory addresses it. But I'd like to steer this into a different direction, because what we critically need right now are two things. One, we need diagnostics, because any approach that looks to abate this pandemic has to involve the detection of it. You can't have quarantines if you don't know who is infected and who isn't. And I think that that's something that has to be job one. Job two, a couple of days ago in a publication, Lancet, which um, I believe uh, you folks have credit for, um, it discussed uh, the Chinese data that came out. And uh, what was striking about it was the, the two parts. People are dying from sepsis or their bodies um, uh, pathogen related, and in this case, bacterial um, uh, reaction to the virus and the, the, what they call comorbidities and opportunistic infections. We need to understand how to deal with that. And the second part of that is also uh, ARDS. Uh, that's where your respiratory system becomes so inflamed that you can't breathe. If we start to understand how to deal with these other issues, we can actually now offer some immediate help to those people that will present at hospitals and those that are severely affected by the coronavirus. Well, thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. Now, last week, President Trump summoned the heads of the big pharmaceutical companies to the White House, and it was a meeting that caught the attention of both mainstream media and satirists. Here's why. Speaking of coronavirus, it has now been found in at least 15 states. Yesterday, Trump met with top execs from Big Pharma to show us he's on top of the crisis. We have nobody in this country vaccinated for coronavirus right now. So that if it goes through the but the same vaccine could not work. You take a, a solid flu vaccine, you don't think that would have an impact or much of an impact on corona? No. Probably none. So a regular, a regular flu vaccine won't work? Uh, weird. What about, what about a solid flu vaccine? I'm talking <laughs> top shelf admiral class. Well, Colbert is funny and cutting as ever, but Professor Stedman, you could see why someone might ask that question, though. I think it's a great question. The flu vaccine does not work against the coronavirus, but the flu vaccine works really well against flu. And so if you don't have flu, you're not going to be going to the ER, you're not going to be using all of the resources that people could otherwise need for coronavirus, and you're not going to the ER where you could be exposed to people with coronavirus. So the flu vaccine is a very good idea. It just doesn't work against coronavirus directly. So indirectly, it actually takes uh, the pressure off the health services. They can then focus on the uh, current coronavirus emergency. Mm -hmm. Where do you think it's likely we will see the first uh, vaccine emerge from? That's a great question. I actually have no idea, and I think it's great that there are multiple people, including Paul, who we talked to earlier, who are working in parallel, and hopefully we're going to end up with something that works, and the sooner the better. Steve, with your knowledge of the industry? I think we're going to see multiple vaccines emerge roughly at the same time. The only question you've got to really ask is, what is the manufacturing capacity for these vaccines as they are... Uh, as they do become available, because it's great to have a vaccine, but you have to be able to make it for very, very broad distribution. And um, that's, a, that's an inherent difficulty in something that's this quick. And would the vaccines be of similar or of variable efficacy? You are asking the right question. Uh, there is a consideration that a lot of vaccines do require booster shots or um, other uh, products like adjuvants, which make the vaccines uh, much more uh, potent. Uh, so it's something that we have to consider as these new vaccines eventually do come online. And Steve, we're coming towards the end of the program. I just wanted to ask you, uh, perhaps, if there is something positive to come out of this crisis, it's that uh, countries around the world have learned perhaps to work better together in future? Absolutely. Unfortunately, this pathogen is one that spreads itself very efficiently, and we have to be prepared to understand that uh, it's a small world, and without cooperation from all communities, from all healthcare systems, that we can't uh, combat this, and we cannot provide for new systems that will be necessary to deal with this virus at the end of the day.
Steve, thank you. And of course, it is very important to have good leadership at the top. And by President Trump's own admission, it's a good thing it's on his watch. And I like this stuff. You know, my uncle is a great person. He was at MIT. He taught at MIT for, I think, like a record number of years. He was a great super genius, Dr. John Trump. I like this stuff. I really get it. People are surprised that I understand. Every one of these doctors said, how do you know so much about this? Maybe I have a natural ability. Maybe I should have done that instead of running for president. Well, a super genius. First time I've heard that expression. Anyway, Professor Stedman and Steve Brozak, thank you so much for your contributions to The Nexus. And thank you at home and on your phones for watching. Remember, you can see this and all our previous episodes on our channel on YouTube. Till next week, then, goodbye.